California, where he was involved in designing integrated circuits for CMOS TV tuners. From March 2010 to November 2010, he was postdoctoral researcher at the University of California. From December 2010 to 2011, he was an assistant professor with Department of Electric Electronics and Electrical Communication Engineering, India Institute of Technology, Karakpur, India. From 2012 January to May 2017, he was an associate professor with the Department of Electronics and Communication Engineering, Amrita University, Amritapuri, India. Since 2017, he has been associate professor at IIT Karakpur. His research interests include analog and mixer signal circuit design, data converters, and signal processing. He received the 2008 Analog Devices Outstanding Student Designer Award and was the co-recipient of 2013 CICC Best Paper Award. He was Associate Editor of IEEE Transactions on Circuits and Systems uh, from August 2014 to December 2015. Since August 2019, he has been the Associate Editor of IEEE Open Journal of Circuits and Systems. With this, we welcome you, sir. You can take over for the talks. Thank you. Uh, thank you, Dr. Mahesh, for the introduction. Uh, good evening, uh, all the participants. Uh, uh, I guess all the participants are spread all across India, so uh, the good thing about having an online thing is we can reach out to a larger audience. Uh, so uh, the talk uh, today's talk is about analysis and design of uh, analog to digital converters um, using a technique called a generalized sampling approach. Uh, so this is the area that I, I started uh, working like uh, roughly three years back. Uh, currently it is in the inception stage uh, and a lot of theoretical work is there and we are trying to build a, a couple of chips uh, using this concept. Uh, this is um, uh, what I'll be presenting is mostly theoretical work uh, and results are yet uh, to be obtained. Uh, silicon as well as other measurement results are yet to be obtained. Um, and uh, this is more signal processing intensive. And uh, uh, one more thing I want to point out is that uh, this technique um, is uh, kind of an alternative to time interleaved ADCs. So uh, with this, I would um, proceed with the talk. Uh, is, are the slides changing now? Is it okay? If one of you can. Yes, sir, it's changing. Yes, sir. Yes. Um, Okay, so this is the outline. So I'll give a brief introduction about ADCs and its applications. Uh, then uh, quickly review different uh, ADCs. Uh, then get into uh, what is something called a time interleaved ADC and what are its issues. Uh, uh, talk about the generalized sampling technique, uh, the signal processing aspect. And uh, we'll discuss how the generalized sampling technique can be used uh, uh, to realize uh, uh, faster ADCs, which can possibly uh, meet uh, 5G application. And then talk about, conclude this talk with some future uh, work that we are also pursuing uh, that will uh, cater towards 5G applications uh, because that requires a huge bandwidth as well as a decent amount of resolution. Uh, uh, that talk won't fit, uh, the details of those work won't fit in this uh, one hour talk. So uh, if anybody's interested, we can have offline discussions regarding this. Uh, so analog to digital converters, and for that matter, any data converters um, uh, are actually the interface between the real world um, and uh, the compute engines, uh, computing engines that we have. And those computing engines are either signal processing, the DSP blocks, digital signal processing uh, batch, uh, batch, uh, blocks, or some computer CPU and all those things. So, uh, so the analog is uh, processed through a signal processing and digitize something called digital converters. So I will abbreviate analog to digital converters as ADCs throughout the talk. And then the DSP takes care of the digitized data, processes it, and then after it has processed it, it then if we need to send it back to the real world, we have to again convert it back to analog using something called a digital to analog converter, uh, which is and then followed by a signal conditioning circuit. And finally, which uh, sends it to the outside uh, world. And one of the outside world might be your antenna, which is uh, which will be sending it to the um, to uh, the air, to space, or uh, so that it can be transmitted. Uh, now, why do we do this? Why do why not? Why do we have this uh, data converter analog to the ADCs and the ACs? Uh, uh, for that matter, because um, uh, the, uh, because the processing uh, can be efficiently done in a signal a digital domain, 
uh, because it is less sensitive to analog noise, uh, you can add a lot of functionality and flexibility. And uh, also the digital blocks are easier to test and design. Uh, so uh, when we are making uh, ICs and all, making chips, complicated chips, we need to make sure that those chips are reliable and they work for that, that many hours. We have to guarantee that they work for 10,000 hours of continuous operation or something like that. So that means in order to say do that, we should be able to design and test them reliably. And digital circuits are much easier to uh, test uh, uh, also. Um, also, digital circuits also uh, scale very well with technology, uh, so that uh, we can pack a lot of uh, functionality in a smaller area. And we can also achieve arbitrary precision, means we can achieve, right now you have 64-bit CPUs, so we can achieve a lot amount, a lot, uh, a lot of precision. Interestingly, Python also, the Python software can achieve better than 64-bit also. Uh, so we can say that we can achieve arbitrary precision for any kind of computation that we need. Um, but the issues is that uh, data converters are difficult to design, especially due to ever increasing performance requirements. Uh, and data converters often present performance bottlenecks, speed, resolution, power dissipation uh, of the uh, 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 of the A2D and D2A become a bottleneck. Uh, so therefore, a, a A2D and D2A sometimes become an overall system. Uh, um, uh, they limit the overall system performance uh, uh, for that matter. So this slide, a couple of slides following this also, we'll discuss some of the typical applications. You will see that um, analog circuits, analog uh, ADCs and D2As are ubiquitous, means they're present in almost every electronics. Anything that you're dealing dealing on a day-to-day -day basis has uh, an ADC. So consumer electronics like audio, TV, video, digital cameras, automotive controls, appliances, toys, everything. Now communications, you have mobile phones, wireless uh, routers, uh, modems and everything have um, uh, data converters in there. Uh, computing means uh, uh, your hard disk, uh, your sound cards, data acquisition cards like oscilloscope, instrumentation, multimeters, or any kind of fabrication instrument, scientific equipment, medical equipment, they all have data converters in them. Uh, similar now another interesting application where uh, a large number of data converters almost thousands of adcs are required are uh, phased error radars which are used by defense um, companies so they have like sometimes they have 3000 adcs uh, 3000 adcs in one so they almost take up one full wafer of uh, this thing they don't even package into ics it's a whole wafer that works uh, for uh, as a uh, whole wafer is used as a phased array radars with some kind of interesting ways to connect all, all the things. Uh, so uh, um, you can think of, but the, those wafers means the dies are inside the wafer, wafer, they need to be connected appropriately. So there are some techniques that are used to do that. So digital beam forming with thousands of ADCs, uh, these find uh, huge applications uh, in modern day, um, uh, especially defense applications. So this was just a run through as to what all, all the ADC applications are. And also another thing is that uh, these applications um, uh, now uh, uh, means each application has its own analog signal bandwidth and uh, each application requires a certain amount of accuracy. So which we can say define in terms of resolution. Now uh, this graph shows uh, for different applications, what are the bandwidth on the x-axis and what is the resolution that is needed? And based on that also, what is the power consumption? The power consumption lines have been drawn. The, um, uh, the, the negative slope lines like one microwatt, one milliwatt, one watt and one kilowatt boundaries define the power consumption of the ADCs for different applications. And uh, you can see that as the bandwidth keeps on increasing and the resolution keeps on increasing, you approach in watts range of ADCs, okay, and the data converters. Uh, so for example, digital oscilloscopes, if you uh, have, uh, uh, I, I'm sure most of you have used an oscilloscope and if you stand near an oscilloscope, there is a fan behind it, just stand behind the fan and see the amount of heat that comes out uh, of that fan. So, and these oscilloscopes are operating at giga samples. They're operating at 10 gigahertz. Some, some of them operate at 100 giga samples per second and they burn a humongous amount of power. So they now, uh, have, um, the wireline interface, uh, the ethernet, they also need, uh, uh, they need to operate at very high speed, but they don't need that many resolution, or two or three bits or in four bits are enough. Uh, three to four bits are more than enough for them. So this is a nice graph which shows for different applications, what is the bandwidth required and what is the resolution required and the corresponding amount of power that we need to burn, okay? 
So now having looked at uh, ADC applications, uh, let's look into the evolution of computing. Okay, in the early 1900, uh, we had, uh, so this graph on the left side, it shows the evolution of computing. Okay, so the computing evolution started in the early 1900 and we are right now in 2020 and you can see how things have evolved. We had mechanical switches, then electromechanical switches, vacuum tubes, discrete transistors, and in the uh, late 90s and early 2000, we had integrated circuits, comp complex integrated circuits to be more precise, and uh, late 2000, early 2000, the, that was the beginning of nanotechnology, and uh, in the 2020 and beyond, we'll, we are in the nanotechnology era. And it shows uh, how the computing industry has evolved, and uh, on the y-axis, it shows how much amount of computation per second can be bought with $1,000. So you can see that there, there, there is a, I mean now, more than a billion computations can be bought for a $1,000, uh, a billion computations per second. So the computation, computing industry has evolved significantly over the time. Now the bottom graph, if you see, and the computing, um, uh, uh, the, uh, the computing application evolved in an exponential manner, and that is that means the microprocessors have evolved in an exponential manner. In the bottom graph, uh, left bottom graph, you can see how the uh, data converters have evolved, ADCs have evolved. You can clearly see a 150x difference in the up till the year 2003, and this gap is even widening. The microprocessors are, processors are getting faster and faster, but the ADCs are not getting as efficient and or as power uh, power efficient as uh, bandwidth efficient as possible. So this gap between the microprocessor and the data converters is a huge gap. Okay, and that brings in a, a lot of challenge. So analog design in nano electronics era, so there is uh, uh, is getting challenging in this uh, uh, era because of low intrinsic device gain, high nonlinearity, uh, reduced headroom, a large variability and mismatches, and survival in system on chip environment. Especially when you have a lot of um, systems, it becomes difficult to integrate analog blocks in there. Uh, pure analog techniques are area and power angry. DSP techniques become more attractive as they use digital gates. So uh, that means we have to resort to more digital techniques to really enhance the performance of analog to digital converters. And um, uh, that's why people resort to different, different techniques. Okay. Uh, now, now let's look at some applications where ADCs become a bottleneck. I mean, uh, they, they are a huge uh, in, uh, for example, in an RF communication receiver, okay. Uh, you need high resolution um, and uh, you need higher speed. That means you want to move the ADC closer to the antenna as possible so you achieve something called direct sampling ADCs. Okay. Uh, now, in wireline receivers, ADCs are a bottleneck because you need a very high sample rate, a decent resolution to be more, uh, not very high sample rate, but decent resolution like two, three, or four bits, six, uh, uh, six bits at the max uh, for wireline uh, receivers. In case of uh, so, in case of uh, biomedical applications, ADCs become a power bottleneck. Uh, so they have to be really ultra low power, okay, uh, so that the battery life is as long as possible, and they can be implanted inside the body. Uh, and also, they become a power bottleneck in wireless sensor networks, uh, which is of relevance uh, nowadays, where IoT is coming up. Uh, uh, so that means uh, you have to make sure that our um, computing, edge computing is as low energy uh, as possible. Uh, uh, just a quick thing, how is the latency when I change the slide, does it change immediately or? Uh... Yeah, it changes. Uh, I think it in part with your uh, talk. Yeah, so there is latency okay. is very less. Yeah. Okay. Thank you. Uh, so um, uh, thus, uh, therefore, in the past two decades, uh, 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 the analog designer de des exploited digital techniques um, uh, like almost uh, late uh, late nineties, early two thousand. They were using digital techniques. Uh, now, the, but we need to really justify how much of digital techniques can be uh, incorporated. Uh, now, this figure here on the left side shows the uh, feature size and the number of energy equivalent gates that are required to achieve, uh, realize a particular SNR. 
uh, in a system. Like uh, if I want, let's say, 12 bit ADC, then uh, the amount of logic uh, gate uh, energy that it that it is equivalent to is given by this uh, here, almost 200,000 um, uh, logic gates uh, for a 70 dB, which is approximately 12 bits. Um, and the figure of merit, uh, which is uh, femtojoules per conversion step, also increases as the uh, sampling rate of the ADC keeps on increasing. Okay, and digitally assisted designs actually bring down the figure of merit. Uh, figure of merit, the lower the figure of merit in terms of femtojoules per conversion step, the better is the ADC in terms of power and overall uh, performance. Okay, so from this graph, we can say that for SNRs less than 50 dB, additional signal processing is expensive. So we need not resort to any kind of signal processing in those scenarios. But for SNRs greater than 50 dB, few thousands of gates has hardly any impact on the overall energy. And in fact, we can incorporate a lot of digital uh, to undo the imperfections in the analog domain. Uh, although I am not discussed, got into the details, I just wanted to motivate that why signal processing or DSP techniques are used in uh, ADCs um, uh, to enhance their performance. Uh, also, I, in order to motivate uh, this talk, um, I would like to again uh, resort to that how mobile phones have evolved over the years. So in the 1980s, uh, we had this uh, mobile phone which was almost uh, 19 centimeters, 20 centimeters in height uh, besides the antenna. Uh, so, and now we have a mobile phone which is like where, and that phone was, uh, was called a brick phone and it was almost a kg. And nowadays we have the Samsung, I, I could not get a better picture, uh, I think 2014, because uh, this 2014 later on I'm using one of the inside uh, things, what is inside that, that's why I'm using this 2014. So it, has, uh, it is barely 200 grams um, and uh, it has uh, 25 hours of talk time and 672 hours of standby. So in 2020 it is even better, I think these phones, uh, Samsung phones have become barely 100 grams, 150 grams. Um, and most of the weight is actually the weight of the battery and uh, uh, and lot more talk time, 48 hours of uh, probably talk time and a huge amount of standby power. Um, so there is a 50x increase in talk time and web browsing plus video and 84x increase in the standby time. This is how technology has evolved over the years. Now let's see what was there inside that brick phone in the 1980s. So you see that it had a discrete op-amp ICs, okay, uh, discrete ADCs and DACs. Okay, they had to have discrete ADCs and DACs in there. So you can see that there is a quad op amp here. Uh, then the, these are the audio processor. This is a discrete audio, uh, DAC, D a D2A converter. Uh, this is a synthesizer. Um, uh, so this is all, this is then 64 KB of storage. Nowadays we have 120 GB of storage. Audio processor was there, discrete frequency synthesizer, discrete demod, and a sim simple 16 or 32 bit microprocessor. Now let's dive into uh, 2015. So the same, uh, the Samsung Galaxy S8, even the modern ones, uh, I think S20 or something is even more sophisticated than this. Unfortunately, I couldn't get an inside picture of that uh, at this point. Uh, so I'm showing this one. So it has a 4G modem, Wi-Fi modem, Bluetooth, GPS, one gigahertz microprocessor with 4 GB of RAM, half a dozen sensor. Uh, that time it was 64 GB and now people go for 512 GB of storage probably. Okay, so the uh, this is all possible because of huge amount of integration that is happening. Now, uh, this talk is in the 5G thing. So in the now 5G has opened up a different uh, aspect where we are targeting bandwidths close to 10 Gbps, uh, data speeds up to 10 Gbps. And this is the uh, IMT scenario, usage scenario. So there are three use scenarios. One is low power for IoT applications low latency for mission critical applications. Mission critical means it has to be self-driving cars. You, have, you want to make sure that you immediately get the response if something happens, right? Uh, so these are safety critical automotives or aviat avionics and all like uh, flight uh, controls and all. Then there are high throughput applications uh, like in-home, home theater system, in-home Wi-Fi and all those things. Uh, third generation partnership project has adopted several strategies to enable the amount of bandwidth necessary for 5G. Okay, uh, so they have now go, going into millimeter wave and all for communication, uh, although they have very little range, but that is what is being used. So the bottom below we show the uh, spectrum. And in fact, the 5G spectrum spans a huge band. 
okay uh, so there is something called the sub 6 gigahertz band and above 6 gigahertz band although it is called sub 6, six gigahertz it extends a little bit above 6 gigahertz and they use a lot of techniques to make sure that they achieve the uh, communication with high data rate with low bit error rate so they use carrier aggregation spatial diversity uh, heavy massive mimo for uh, all this uh, for these systems so the multiple antennas and all uh, so all these systems, to in, once you increase the band, need high sample rate ADCs. Okay. Now let's try to see how fast is 5G. Okay. So 3G was 42.2 Mbps. 4G LTE was 100 Mbps. 4G cat. No, now there are different categories of 4G. Okay. So there are rev revisions that keep on happening. I think revision 20 is uh, this year or something. 19 or there. So cat 5 category 5 is 150 Mbps. Then 4G LTE advanced is uh, 1000 Mbps, which is 1 Gbps, and 5G is supposed to achieve almost 10 Gbps. Okay, uh, so as I mentioned earlier, uh, the spectrum for uh, uh, the uh, 5G that we can uh, we can harness is varies from 450 megahertz to 7.1 to 5 gigahertz. Uh, which is commonly referred to as sub 6 gigahertz. Although in this band, in the frequency range one, which spans from 450 megahertz to 7.125 gigahertz, you have this two point Bluetooth and others. So obviously there won't be any communication in those bands. Then uh, there is a frequency range two, which spans from 24.5 gigahertz to 52.6 gigahertz. This is a lot. Uh, this is a millimeter wave range, which is typically used for automotive applications and uh, uh, some very small uh, distance communication uh, that is used. The carrier bandwidths are either 50, 100, 240, or 400 megahertz, depending on the subcarrier spacing that is used. So when you are trying to go for bandwidths of 400 megahertz, you have to go for high sample rate ADCs. So now this 5G brings in a lot of challenge in terms of uh, not only the high sample rate ADCs, but also a good amount of resolution is required. So now if we go back to this chart, if we want um, very high sample rate in tens of gigahertz of range, and let's say we target 12, um, uh, 12 bit resolution, you are sitting at close to uh, this is spaced uh, uh, like almost 10 watts or something, 10 watts of power. So that means your cell phone or something which is trying to uh, communicate with 5G, if we go the conventional route, you might have to burn like 10 watts of power with your battery. That means your battery will die out very quickly. So there have to be uh, there has to be alternatives. There has to be different ways uh, that needs to be. So this opens up new challenges. So now having uh, said uh, the application space, uh, space, let's move on to the um, uh, the uh, the so the data conversion problem. As I said, uh, the real world is analog. The uh, our, uh, the processing world is digital. So we pro like to process everything in digital domain because of the reasons we have already outlined. Uh, so now the two problems that arise is how to discretize in time and amplitude. So when you go from analog world to digital world, there are two kinds of discretization happening. First is discretization in time and then discretization in amplitude. Uh, discretization in time leads to discrete time signal processing and discretization in amplitude and time leads to digital signal processing. Okay, uh, discrete time signal processing has a time index and digital signal processing has sample index. There is no concept of time at that point. It is uh, samples inputs. Now, how to discretize in time and amplitude? That is an ADC problem, analog to digital conversion. How to undiscretize in time and amplitude when we have to go from the digital world back to the analog world? That is undiscretization in time and amplitude. You have the D2A conversion. Okay. Uh, so, as I said, so analog signal in order to discretize, you have to make sure that there is no aliasing because sampling leads to aliasing. So you need to have an anti-aliasing filter, which is the signal conditioning circuit followed by sampling, then leading to quantization. And so sampling gives you discretization in time domain, quantization gives you discretization in amplitude domain. Now those discrete amplitudes are then converted back into analog. And then they are finally passed through a reconstruction filter. And we'll be discussing about this reconstruction filter a lot towards uh, in this uh, talk because this becomes a key to the generalized sampling thing. And finally, the waveform is an analog. So whatever comes out can exactly be reconstructed if we, uh, if we satisfy certain conditions. Okay, so we'll focus on ADC sampling. Mostly uniform sampling is done. 
uh, non-uniform sampling becomes a different problem um, and there are a lot of interesting work that has happened and uh, that are still happening uh, in case of non-uniform sampling. In fact, a lot of the ADCs that we realize, the time interleaved ADCs, uh, that also the timing mismatch boils down to something called non-uniform sampling. So you have to undo the effects of uh, that and that is uh, that becomes a separate topic. Uh, then how do you quantize and encoding? So now quantization and encoding strategy defines various types of analog to digital converters, ADC. So you have flash ADC, uh, successive approximation register ADC, pipeline ADC, and these are called Nyquist rate ADCs. Okay, then you have something called Delta Sigma ADC. These are called oversampled ADCs. Okay, so two kinds of ADCs. High sample rate is achieved by time interleaving Nyquist rate ADCs. Uh, it is difficult to time interleave Delta Sigma ADCs. So I should not say that Delta Sigma ADCs cannot be time interleaved. People have done time interleaving of Delta Sigma ADCs. And once you time interleave delta sigma ADCs, you have to uh, use some interesting feedback topologies. Some work has happened in early 2000 and all in uh, time interleaving delta sigma ADCs. And also you have to, sometimes when you time interleave delta sigma ADC, you might get end up with something called bandpass ADCs and all. So people have used it. So that's why I should not say that time interleaving of delta sigma ADCs cannot be done. But we have to be careful when time when we are doing because the spectral characteristic of the output can change if you time interleave a delta sigma ADC. So a Nyquist rate ADC can be efficiently time interleaved um, uh, without worrying about anything to do with the, um, anything uh, that would cause. Um, uh, if I time interleave. In, K, in the ideal scenario, there is, I do not have to worry about the spectral characteristic. Let me put it that way. But if I time interleave a delta sigma ADC, if I am not careful, the output spectral characteristics would change. So we have to be really careful when we are time interleaving a delta sigma ADC. Uh, keep in mind, ideal, non-ideal things are different. So now the flash ADC is the simplest and it's the fastest. And you find this being used in um, oscilloscopes, digital oscilloscopes, uh, very often. So they use these 8-bit flash ADCs operating at 10 giga samples per second. Uh, serial links also use flash ADCs of 3 or 4 bits. Uh, flash ADCs are used for very high speed application. Uh, encoding takes thermometer code as input and gives binary code as output. Then there is something called a SAR ADC. Uh, what it does is it does a binary search algorithm. It, it finds out uh, the input signal um, uh, is gets digitized of uh, every cycle one bit of the input signal gets resolved uh, and in the in, it happens in this closed loop here after the all the bits have been resolved then this VDAC approaches the V input okay uh, so basically it approach finally it becomes equal to both of them at that point uh, we have resolved it so it takes if I have to resolve n bits it takes n cycles at least uh, to be more precise it might take n plus one cycles uh, so uh, flash ADC instantly it digitizes. That's why it's called a flash ADC. In one instant it digitizes. Su successive approximation register takes n cycles to resolve n bits. So now, uh, as you can see, the flash ADC requires two to the power of n minus one comparators if n is the resolution of the ADC. Successive approximation register requires one comparator. So when we reduce the number of comparators, you need more cycles. Now, a two-step architecture is a balance between the two. It actually uh, uh, does uh, the quantization in two steps. And these two steps can be changed to multi-step digitization in multiple cycles, each cycle resolving a few bits. That becomes a pipeline ADC. Okay. Uh, now, uh, why two-step architecture? Now, if I have an M-bit ADC, we would need 2 to the power M minus 1 comparators in a flash ADC. But it will do it very fast. But if I go for a two-step architecture, it can also work very fast. But And if each step is resolving m by 2 bits, then you need 2 to the power m by 2 minus 1. That's an order of magnitude reduction in the number of comparators that you get. So lesser the number of comparators, uh, lesser is the input capacitance, larger is the bandwidth. You can always digitize more and more uh, uh, bandwidth signals if the capacitance is smaller. Okay, so now, as I said, um, uh, the generalized sampling technique um, is an alternative to time interleaved. So let me first show what is a time interleaved, a method to sample high bandwidth signals using low sample rate ADCs. Okay, 
So just to show, this is an illustration from analog devices uh, um, uh, documentation. Uh, so what what happens is that if we take two ADCs, each operating at 100 mega samples per second, that means each one sampling at 100 megahertz, and um, each one is alternately sampling one's uh, sample. Uh, ADC one is sampling uh, these uh, dots, which are denoted with one, and ADC two is sampling with two. Um, then and we then combine the sample inter the samples are interleaved cleverly. Then we have as if the signal has been digitized at 200 mega samples per second. So that means for this to work, the ADC one will be working with a phase zero zero degree clock, and ADC two will be working with the inverse of that clock, which is a 180 degree out of phase clock. Okay, and uh, uh, 100 megahertz uh, ADC would have a bandwidth of 50 megahertz. But as soon as we time interleave two of them, each one is operating at 100 megahertz. Then you get a bandwidth of 100 megahertz. You have doubled the bandwidth. Okay. So now the problem. Uh, uh, let's see uh, uh, what what are the issues with the time interleaved ADC. So a time interleaved ADC would require if I have n channels of time interleaving, I would require n phase clock. Okay. Uh, these are the n phases of the clock. Clock one to clock n. And these phases have to be generated using a PLL or DLL. So you would need an additional circuitry to generate those uh, phases, and those phases have to be cleanly generated. Okay. And uh, another important thing is that if you see carefully, uh, the input signal gets loaded with at least n by two of the channels. Okay. That is what will happen in the system. Uh, half the number of channels. So that means the input sees a huge amount of loading. So that means the input driver becomes a problem. And sometimes in an RF application, the input that is going into the ADC could be an output of a low noise amplifier follow up. Uh, if we are going for direct sampling, uh, direct sampling receiver, direct sampling ADC, RF sampling ADCs. That means you're sampling directly on the antenna. So antenna, the uh, output of the antenna uh, goes to the uh, low noise amplifier. The output of the low noise amplifier can drive the ADC. Now, if there are too many ADCs, then the low noise amplifier bandwidth gets compromised, speed gets compromised, characteristics might get compromised. So you might need an additional buffer so that the LNA performance is maintained, noise figure is maintained. So that adds to power and all other things. Uh, so that's why we say that increased loading of the input buffer driver. Okay. Uh, now, other challenges are if there is an offset. Now, if you see, if I have two ADCs, each operating in uh, opposite phase of the clock, that means, and if let's say there is no signal, if I don't give any signal, then the output of this ADC will be ping-ponging between uh, V offset 1 and V offset 2. If I look at the spectrum of this, this is nothing but a spectrum at Fs by 2. So therefore, uh, if I have uh, the, any a offset between the two channels uh, would result in a, a spurious tone at Fs by 2. And if it is an n-channel ADC, it will result in sp spur, spurious tones at Fs by n. And the magnitude of the spur is proportional to the offset that is there. So the solution is do not null the offset of these two. This would give you a big problem in the rear, in the receiver design, in an RF receiver, because um, uh, you might, uh, what if there is a DC signal that you need to digitize? So do not null the offset. Instead, match the offset of the two things. So this is an important aspect. Okay, uh, So matching the offset is better than nulling the offset. So the effort should be made to match the offset. Next uh, mismatch is if and when we have two channels, uh, then the two channels could have different gains. If I have two different gains, then each ADC is giving you outputs which have different uh, values. Uh, they one might be larger than the other. So that means now when I am sampling, when I am interspersing the resampling block, digital sampling, it will now have a thing that will be jogging around. Uh, there will be a, a thing, so it will be sampling this value on the orange, then blue in the next one, orange, blue, orange, blue. So it will be going like that. So this would mean that there would be a signal at the required point, but there will be a spur at Fs by 2 minus the signal bandwidth. So therefore, gain mismatch leads to spurious tones at Fs over n, if it's n channel interleaving, plus minus Fn. Similarly, there is a timing mismatch. This is a multi-phase clock. What if the phases are slightly misaligned? This would lead also to a spur. So this will lead to a, the two uh, signals will have the same amplitude, but they will have a different phase. 
Now, when I am uh, digitizing, if you can see, I'll traverse between the alternate samples will come between the orange and the blue cycles. So now this would lack like a tone, spurious tone around the fundamental of the actual sine wave. Okay. Similarly, there is a bandwidth mismatch. Now the signal that is coming for input is getting into the IDC. If the bandwidth of the first channel and the second channel are different, again you get a different characteristic. Again, that would lead to not only a gain change, it will lead to a gain change, but it will also lead to an offset. So the resultant is will be a combination of these two. Keep in mind a bandwidth. Uh, uh, the, uh, bandwidth would lead to both a phase shift as well as a gain change will manifest as both phase and, and that is uh, the combination of these two and therefore it would manifest as a spur. Now is there an alternative to time interleaved ADC that does not require multi-phase clock? It reduces the loading of the input buffer, can overcome gain mismatch, bandwidth and bandwidth mismatch in a different way and meets a high sample rate of time interleaved ADC. That is the goal. And uh, the, can we explore some other things? So with this, we'll get into the generalized sampling uh, architecture. Now, let me give you a little bit of history on generalized sampling. Okay, uh, Shannon in his classic paper in 1949, uh, which was titled Communications in the Presence of Noise, stated that, uh, stated the following fact in the yellow highlight uh, without proof. He did not give a proof of this. This is what he said. One can further show that the value of the function and its derivative at every other sample point are sufficient. The value and first and second derivatives at every third sample point give a still different set of parameters which uniquely determine the function. So that means what he tried to say in 1949 is that if I, if I, if I have to sample a signal, if I have a signal of bandwidth 50 megahertz, ideally I'm supposed to sample it at 100 megahertz. Right, but by time interleaving two ADCs, each one sampling at 50 can give me a, that same band, same thing, can reconstruct a 50 megahertz signal. Now, what he's saying that instead of say sampling the signal, if I sample the signal and its function at half the sample rate, I can still determine what was the signal. That is what he said. He, but he said it without proof. He did not prove it. Later on, Fogel and J J Jagerman in their papers in 1955 and 56 proved this and they used that in the context of aircraft instrumentation. That time it was a big challenge. Aircraft instrumentation was a challenge because these uh, flights, these uh, fighter jets, that is Cold War era, fighter jets used to, they could achieve, they have achieved, they had achieved supersonic speed by then probably in the 50s, late 50s I think, uh, but they were trying to achieve that speed. At that speed, the fighter avionic electronics should be able to find the speed as well as the velocity, uh, uh, so sorry, find the velocity as well as the distance, uh, exact location as quickly as possible, but they did not have a sampling system to do that as quickly. So they thought that, okay, I don't have a high speed sampling system, but I can sample both the velocity as well as the location, means I'm sampling the distance as well as its derivative, which is the velocity. And I can reconstruct my position accurately with a faster sample rate. That's what he says. And this yellow thing is what Jager, Fogelman and Jager stated in the paper. Both the papers are listed here. This was later on generalized by Popolis in 1997, 1977, and hence came to be known as generalized sampling theorem. Okay. So let us see what it says. It says that if XCT is a uh, continuous time signal is W band limited, that means its Fourier transform is omega between greater than zero. So omega x omega equal to zero for omega greater than uh, w. So here keep in mind we are using omega capital omega as the analog frequency and we'll use digital omega uh, as the um, as the digital frequency. Okay and uh, so uh, x it is w band limited if its Fourier transform is this and its energy is finite so if this is there. Uh, XCT is given by its inverse, inverse Fourier transform. So I see a typo here. So okay, a small omega should have been capital omega. Small omega is the digital frequency. Uh, resulting in the following interpolation formula originally given by Whitaker. So it is a sync function. Okay. So XCT can be conveniently reconstructed from its samples. Sampled at Nyquist. TQ, oh sorry, this is also type four TQ. Um, this is a Nyquist rate of sampling by passing it through this sync function, which is the the time domain response and the frequency domain. This is a rectangular uh, window, rectangular uh, filter, low pass filter, uh, and this is known as a well. This is the well-known sampling theorem. Okay, so this is the reconstruction of the analog signal. So 
now what uh, uh, Shannon say stated without proof and then later on Fogel and Jagerman proved it and finally Popolis has generalized it he said that if I have a signal and I take different functions of the signal okay h1 h2 hn are uh, linear systems okay and giving me outputs f1 t f2 t and now if I sample these at t t which is uh, uh, n times tq because it is n channel n times the Nyquist bandwidth means I'm sampling at one nth the sample rate if I do this and I pass them through appropriate reconstruct filters I can reconstruct the signal as if I have sampled data at tq so as stated earlier the band limited signal can be reconstructed exactly from the samples fk nt which are the outputs of uh, n LTI filters hk omega for k equal to 1 to n and t equal to n tq fkt are undersampled means they're heavily aliased so if you look at this fk and t are aliased as fkt for k equal to are band limited to w xct is band limited to w xct followed by h1 omega will also be band limited to w okay with some characteristic of course okay Proper reconstruction requires that the aliases get effectively cancelled, which is done by PK omega. So these things are going to, because once I sample this W limited signal at, uh, in w, w, if the bandwidth is W of this signal, then it should be sampled at twice W. But this sampling operation is happening at twice W divided by N. That means F1 NT, F2 NT, Fn NT are heavily aliased. Okay. Now, if I want to recover those alias signals, then I have to pass them through reconstruction filters. Okay, these reconstruction filters are called alias cancellation filters. Okay, now how can we use this to build analog to digital converters? So, uh, what he said that now the thing is that how first of all we have to find out how to obtain these reconstruction filters. Okay, uh, so the reconstruction filter Popolis uh, gave this proof. He said that for perfect reconstruction, the undersampled signals need to be passed through reconstruction filters given by YKT. This is the time domain expression of these filters. Okay, P1, P, um, PK omega are the Fourier transform of YKT. Okay, uh, we'll discuss, we'll explain that more later. Now, what uh, Popolis said um, that the YKT can be obtained. Uh, by this is ykt is obtained by the integral of yk omega t so yk omega t are time varying filters okay these are yk time varying filters he said that if i have this system of linear equations okay if i have this system of linear equations where uh, then uh, i can find out what are these time varying filters and once i find out these time varying filters then i can find out ykt and then I can take the Fourier transform and, of course, set back the actual uh, this thing. So this is what he said. But this is much more cumbersome. Basically, what you have to do is you have to solve this system of equations first. Then you have to do an integral of the equation, okay, to obtain this type, uh, this thing, okay. Now, is there a better way where we directly find this P1 omega without resorting to uh, going to a time varying filter, first getting a time varying filter and coming back with these things? Okay, so Brown in his paper in 1981 showed that this can be efficiently done by uh, basically each of these uh, uh, these filter. These are heavily aliased. So what he does is he can we can set up a system of equations um, uh, for these within this bandwidth. There will be n such bandwidth in the complete interval from minus w to plus w. We can set up a system of equations and solve this thing. Okay, so all this matrix and uh, this matrix will show what this matrix is. So A inverse times this, this gives me the reconstruction filters for each of those regions. I'll give an example how it's done also. Okay, now this A matrix is given by this uh, thing where ASJ is given by this uh, transfer function AJ omega S minus 1 times C. C is equal to twice W divided by N, the sample rate of each channel. Okay. Thus, obtaining PK omega would require inverting n cross n matrices, uh, n cross n matrix whose elements are the analog transfer functions HK omega with different shifts for k equal to 1 to n. So let's look at an example. 
let's consider a two channel case where h1 is equal to 1 and h2 omega is equal to the derivative of the signal this is a classic case where distance and velocity is being measured so in case in your car you have the odometer and the speedometer so yeah you can reconstruct the distance by monitoring the odometer and speedometer at half the rate perfectly uh, 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 reconstruct both the velocity as well as uh, at the full sample rate okay so now therefore the a matrix is given by this expression and a inverse is given by this over here there is nothing fancy here h1 omega is 1 h1 omega minus w is also 1 h2 omega is j omega h2 omega minus w is j omega minus w okay so because a each of the elements are h omega s minus 1 c okay so uh, now uh, what we do is for now there are two regions because it is two channel two regions the regions are from minus w to 0 and the 0 uh, 0 to uh, minus, uh, 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 0 to w okay that is the band limited thing so for k equal to 1 we get p omega in from minus w to 0 okay p, we get the solution for p omega similarly for k equal to 2 we get p omega plus uh, this for this range omega plus w so this omega plus w is nothing but the right half from minus omega to 0 we have already obtained omega plus w corresponds to now 0 to w so therefore p1 omega is therefore given by this expression over here okay and this is drawn over here p1 omega is the if the first channel is there is nothing in the first channel and the second channel is is the derivative of the signal then the reconstruction filters are given by these two graphs okay and the impulse response by we take the inverse fourier transform of this and we get the impulse response so we are not going the time varying filter method uh, that popolis had proposed uh, in fact this is a much more efficient method and we can easily find out the overall um, uh, transfer function now similarly if i go for another sampling where i take the signal and h2 omega is the integral of the signal okay this is a classic case where velocity and distance is being distance is the integral of velocity is being measured okay so same thing i mean you can either measure the current or the charge and uh, but these are also in case of electrical engineering these are the uh, matrix so the a matrix is going to be given by this and if i so go through the same methodology the two reconstruction filters that i obtain look something like this this is a kind of a, a, a parabolic uh, like a circular thing because square term omega square comes in so it is a, a kind of a circular and this is more like a uh, a straight line over there so p1 and p2 omega are the reconstruction filters and p1 t and p2 t are the impulse response okay so this all looks good means what it that i uh, so what it means is this signal is sampled so this is discrete time it is not is discrete in quantization no adc here and then this discrete time signal goes through this uh, analog reconstruction filter to give me back the analog signal now how do we exploit this to build an adc so what we can do is uh, we can do something like this uh, in order to realize an adc we need to obtain x of n the samples so both in discrete amplitude as well as in discrete time the continuous time reconstruction filters are converted to discrete time reconstruction filters by using interpolation identity okay so now we have xct and you have uh, these uh, uh, channels over uh, these multiple ADCs, each operating with a single phase clock. There is no multi phase clock here. What it receives is a signal, its derivative, second derivative, nth derivative. This is the generalized case. Now, in order to now the output should be at, uh, appearing at n times the sample rate of these ADCs, n times fs. So that means we up sample, okay, very simple up sampling pass it through digital reconstruction filter p1 tilde omega keep in mind p1 tilde is obtained from the continuous time by using the interpolation identity uh, which i'm stating without proof that this is what we do okay so xct is band limited to w adc1 to adc n are sampling at twice w by n so i am sampling at one nth the rate i'm supposed to sample same as in time interleaved but with a single phase clock goal is to realize the sample rate of 2 n w up sample by a factor of n that means you up sample this by a factor up sampling by a factor of n from basic signal processing we know that it leads to n minus 1 images which are nothing but aliases in the continuous time case okay uh, p k omega for k equal to 1 to n cancels out the images and generate xn at a sample rate of 2 n w 
Therefore, you achieve high sample rate without multi-phase clock and an alternative to time interleaved ADC. Another interesting thing is that between the input signal and the ADC, there are some transfer functions coming. Okay, so that means the input driver. Now, ADC is sampled system. So, in the uh, earlier, we showed that when uh, the input is sampled onto the ADC, there is a sampling operation happening on the input driver here. Now the sampling operation is ha happening on these functions. Now you might say that these functions, if they're re realized using active devices, they will burn power. But the interesting thing is that we can realize these functions using passives and uh, without consuming any power. And now the thing is that now the input driver is seeing this passive network. So any switching that happens here it does not reflect on the input device as strongly as it would in a time interleaved case. Okay, uh, so therefore there will be uh, therefore the input driver can settle back quickly to its desired value after the switching has happened. So there is less amount of uh, which uh, this kind of switching is sometimes you can call it as kickback or something um, uh, that can happen. So uh, this kind of minimizes. So not only does it require a single phase clock but it reduces the loading on the input buffer. The input buffer has to drive some passive networks, okay? Um, and uh, uh, therefore I say that it is an alternative to time interleaved ADC. Of course you need is digital filters. Now we can use efficient digital filtering algorithm like um, uh, noble identity in multi-rate signal processing to realize these filters uh, and also we can do um, uh, a polyphase decomposition of these filters in the signal processing domain and realize efficient filters to uh, so that these the power, these are all digital so we don't need to burn that much power over here so i know that i am i'm reaching 7:30 i think i need another uh, 15 minutes to wrap this up is that okay yes sir it's okay Bye. I'm sorry. I'm so uh, so. What we have done is we have done the analysis for a two-channel case. So for the two-channel, this is what it is uh, uh, it looks like, and the ADC is modeled by a linear model. Okay, which with quantization noise. ADC in channel one and channel two are sampling at W. Goal is to realize a sample rate of twice W, up sampled by a factor of two. Um, the P1 omega and P2 omega cancel out the images due to undersampling. Now, how do you quantify the out, uh, spectral characteristics of the digitized signal? Uh, we have to quantify that in terms of SQNR and the alias suppression. Now, these uh, this H2 omega, we can choose a differentiator or a low pass filter or passive CR low pass filter. So we can have these are passive. Uh, differentiator and integrators are difficult to realize. So this uh, we have put in, this is not an ideal differentiator. This is not an ideal integrator. This is an ideal differentiator with a certain gain so that the ADC doesn't uh, saturate. And similarly, this is an uh, uh, integrator so that the ADC doesn't saturate. Okay, so these are the A matrices and the corresponding A inverse matrices. And I'm going through this uh, quickly, unfortunately. So then the reconstruction filters are given by uh, these functions over here, if you work out the math. And the time domain impulse response in discrete time domain is given by these things. Okay, These uh, reconstruction filters in time domain by, are obtained by using interpolation identity uh, to these filters over here given in the top table. Okay. Uh, now, in order to do an SQNR analysis, you can see that this quantization noise and this quantization, if you see here, these two quantization noise go through a filter. So whenever quantization noise goes through a filter, this quantization noise, if I treat it as a random process, it will go through some kind of, of uh, uh, some uh, kind of uh, filtering process through this and finally get added up. Now, if we want to identify it clearly, we need to make sure that whether uh, these two are uncorrelated or correlated. So what we did is we did an exercise where we took this one and obtained Q1 plus Q2 in this manner. So if you work out this thing, this is equal to Q1 plus Q2. So what we did is we have we showed that uh, variance of Q1 plus Q2 is equal to the variance of Q1 plus Q2 as per the plot over here for an 8-bit case, which is equal to twice delta square by 12. This implies that Q1 and Q2 are uncorrelated. Now, when the quantization noise in each channel is filtered by these two, then the net quantization noise is given by this expression. This is a uh, well-known uh, well expression. 
and uh, therefore the quantization noise can be obtained. So you might say that the quantization noise degrades a little bit, which is true in this case, but it doesn't impact the performance. So the SQNR has been quantified here, and we have simulated for integrator RC low pass filter and CR high pass filters, and we see that we can achieve the desired performance if we choose the filter per parameters properly. Okay, so these are the SQNR uh, bounds on the overall uh, system. And now the alias suppression is uh, uh, defined as what is the signal component? After upsampling, you have the images, and what is the power of the image? The signal power divided by the image power. So if we go through this analysis, it will turn out uh, we can compute this. Uh, this is a closed form expression based on these uh, transfer functions. And these are the simulation results for a differentiator, integrator, low pass filter, and high pass filter. So interestingly, you can achieve the required performance uh, for 10 bit, uh, 12 bit, and 14 bit systems. Okay, and these B equal to 16 bits are the coefficients of the digital filter, bit widths of the digital filters that are used. And uh, you might say that we are needing a lot of taps, but if you work out, uh, if, if you quantize the number of taps, what happens is that the number of taps, um, some of the taps are very similar or almost similar, and therefore these tra taps actually translate to fewer number of taps in here. And these taps are realized using digital circuits, and they'll be very tiny, and the hardware power consumption will be way smaller compared to uh, what it were if we had to realize it uh, using any other means. So, uh, uh, in short, uh, I would say upcoming applications require large bandwidth, so which requires high sample rate ADCs. Uh, need to explore alternatives to realize uh, realizing high sample rate ADCs. Generalized sampling technique can be explored as an alternative to time interleaved ADCs. Okay. Uh, besides high sample rate, uh, we are also exploring an another uh, option where can we do something so that I can relax the resolution of the ADC. If I relax the resolution of the ADC, then I can achieve higher bandwidth with lower power. So, back to this. Uh, so, if I realize low resolution ADCs, I can operate at a very high sample rate and achieve the same uh, uh, with lo much lower power right but with but the specification requires that i should have a high resolution adc can i do something cleverly on the signal so that i can digitize with low resolution and get the performance as if it is a high resolution that interesting thing that we are working on um, uses which uses the concept of uh, um uh, 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 concepts from uh, image processing and all uh, to do so, uh, so that we can precondition the signals and thereby uh, reduce the resolution and operate at a very high sample rate with moderate power and do post processing on the digital data to get back the uh, performance as if it was a 12 bit system. Okay, uh, this is a new area we are exploring. So uh, it's with it, uh, and uh, we are uh, planning to tape out a chip to demonstrate that idea. Uh, with this, I would uh, conclude the talk. Um, uh, I, I'm open to any questions now. Uh, thank you, sir. So we'll move on to questions. So the first question is uh, quite interesting. Is um, so when we say that 4G has the speed of 100 uh, Mbps and all, but uh, when we ultimately get in our phone, we get only 10 Mbps, something like that. So where is the limitation? There is the question. Oh, the, the, so uh, the thing is that, uh, see, the communication uh, 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 you have, uh, especially in wireless communication, there is a lot of uh, error rate. And um, whenever there is an error, packet error, um, so there is something called a bit error and there is something called a packet error, right? So uh, usually in these uh, communication, they send packets. And if the packet has an error, then it drops the whole thing and it again retransmits it. Okay, so you might, uh, so that's why, so you have to account for that. So your speed is pretty good, but you lose quite a bit of data, especially when you are uh, traveling on the car, uh, traveling or something. 
because of fading and others. So if you get one bit error, that means the packet becomes an error and you have to drop the whole thing, you have to retransmit. So you lose a lot of information, which doesn't happen in a wireline receiver. If you connect to the Ethernet cable, that goes at a full rate without any problems. If you are near the base station, uh, Wi-Fi modem, if you are near the Wi-Fi near your home, you will get the full bandwidth, full uh, benefit of the bandwidth because there will be very little attenuation, very little error rate at that point. I hope that I, that answers that question. Yes. Uh, so next question is, uh, when you said time interleaving had so many disadvantages, uh, so then currently uh, in all these time interleaving based ADCs, uh, so how are these limitations overcome currently? So they uh, do a lot of uh, uh, corrections. Um, so there, there is an uh, there is a digital engine that is sitting uh, after the ADC that estimates the offset and equalizes the offset. Then there is an engine that estimates the gain and equalizes the gain. And what they sometimes do is instead of suppose they have a four channel time interleaved ADC inside the IC they will have five ADCs. Okay, so and uh, when one channel uh, when four ADCs will be doing the operation, the fifth one is getting calibrated. Its gain and timing uh, gain is getting estimated. So and then you, uh, then you switch on to the next ADC, and that's uh, the cycle through the ADCs also. Um, now timing mismatch, there is an engine that estimates the timing mismatch. So all these mismatch, uh, uh, there are engines that do it, and also you take care of uh, in design to some extent that there is the mismatch and these effects are as small as possible. So for example, for 8-bit time interleaved, you do not need that much of estimation, but for 12-bit time interleaved ADCs, you need a huge engine that does the offset estimation, uh, timing mismatch estimation, and the gain estimation. Uh, so next is, um, I think this is, this is related to the last few slides. Uh, so in the alias uh, suppression, uh, whatever you show the graphs, so the integrator uh, uh, graph had more uh, peaks or probably the ripples when compared to the differentiator and uh, the other filter type. So why is that? So uh, the integ integrator has, okay, now the <clears throat> integrator, you know, doesn't work that well at DC. It has an infinite gain. So you can see that the thing drops off uh, close to DC. Now these uh, peaks, um, uh, actually that, that, okay, so that is a very interesting phenomenon. It took us quite a while to figure out why we see these peaks over here. Um, <clears throat> uh, that has something to do with the, um, okay. So the filter that we have is uh, all, all zero filter, okay. Uh, so how should I explain it? Uh, whoever it is, uh, you, they can probably shoot me an email. I think I would rather answer it uh, uh, with a write-up because it is difficult to explain unless I draw something and all. So whoever has this question, uh, please shoot me an email and uh, uh, please copy Miss uh, Satish in the loop and I can reply back. Okay. Uh, next question is regarding the fabrication challenges of these chips and uh, how do you uh, fabricate these? Are they, what are the challenges in fabricating these? So, chips. I mean, uh, fabricating uh, the challenges means, uh, <clears throat> first of all, uh, for example, we are doing design here in uh, 28 nanometer um, uh, TSMC and also in um, 180 nanometer and 65 nanometer. So we design the chips. Uh, so uh, we, uh, so I don't understand the question properly, but challenges means we fabricate through Euro practice, uh, which sends it to TSMC or UMC for fabrication. And uh, when we are, um, uh, the whole process, I mean, I would say the schematic design process, of, uh, uh, design of the thing takes roughly six to eight months. And then the layout of the whole thing um, uh, takes roughly three to four months. Uh, the, these are all done by one or two students. So I'm giving these are times in terms of the student time, not professional times, industry people. Uh, three, four months and then the chip comes back and uh, uh, we have to, of course, when we do the tape of fabrication and everything from academia, we try to not do the digital part as much. We try to do the, if we are doing only analog and the innovation is in the analog, we do the analog part only. 
and we can take the digital output from the system and feed it to an FPGA and do the digital processing in an FPGA. That is how we do it. So I'm not sure if I got the question correctly, what are the challenges? Um, uh, so uh, there are uh, the challenges in, I mean, if you are from academia, it means you have to, when you are doing the layout, you have to do post layout extraction, post layout simulation. It takes a while to actually uh, do all these things, figure out why this is happening, and uh, then finally fabricate the chip. Okay. Uh, so that's all with the question because most of the other questions are related to certain. Uh, can you share some materials on books on reading about uh, reading more about these ADCs uh, and uh, uh, all these techniques? Okay, so so sure. Uh, I can. Uh, uh, there are uh, for different types. What they are working on, there are different books and different things. Um, but what I would suggest whoever is in academia is that ADC design, I, my uh, small suggestion is, is not just an analog design in this day and age. ADC design is a system design problem where um, yeah, you have to consider uh, uh, not only signal process, basic signal processing, but multi-rate signal processing. See, what we have done in generalized sampling is multi-rate signal processing, okay, because you have upsampling and decimation and all. So you have to go for multi, understand multi-rate signal processing, some as communication aspects. Um, and we are using some image processing algorithm in ADCs now. So uh, my thing is that do not restrict yourself to um, uh, uh, just analog design because in, in the year 2020 and following after this, ADC design won't be an analog design problem anymore. It will be a system design problem where a person, ADC designer has to understand DSP, Multi-rate signal processing, okay, and uh, some as some basic things about image processing and uh, uh, transforms and all that he has to understand. I think one more question is there. Uh, so all this generalized sampling approach uh, based ADCs, they will be used when we go for direct sampling of, of these uh, millimeter wave signals. Uh, uh, currently, if we go for sub six, do we need this or can we still use the time interleave based approaches for that? So, uh, see, I uh, see again, I'm saying this is an alternative. Uh, we are still working on it. And uh, uh, so, uh, this, uh, so what I have not shown, what I have shown here uh, is gives decent performance but then what we have uh, uh, the later part uh, so we have broken down this problem is so the problem uh, let's for reformulate it in this manner the problem was that uh, so we started off with the problem like this we said that what are the simple recon uh, uh, filters analog filters which do not burn any current then we found out the reconstruction filters in digital domain so these are RCC or low pass filter. What we found out is that for two channel, these things become complicated and for four channel, um, these become even more complicated. Instead, what we did is we went the reverse way. Suppose I decide this, uh, pre-decide these digital filters. What are the corresponding analog filters which are still passive and do not consume any power? and still give us this benefit and there there are some very interesting results that is again a problem of kind more like a, a filter bank problem and we have uh, some things where uh, we come up we use very simple digital filters here and the analog filter turns out to be just averaging blocks of some samples of the signals and uh, those things i feel that can be used uh, for like a sub gigahertz range I, that's what i feel but we have to first show that and if it works then we can really uh, uh, first we have to show it ourselves so we have not done it yet we are in the process of fabricating the chip um, uh, we are working with the industry uh, hopefully we'll have something by end of next year in this regard uh, so yeah, I think one more question in the last one someone has put. Uh, so when you say signal processing to reduce the number of samplings, uh, is it in any way related to machine learning or can you just uh, tell what kind of signal processing techniques are used? Uh, what kind of signal processing techniques? So what we have done is basic sampling. There is nothing more. This is just pure sampling. 
and reconstruction uh, equations right and multi rate signal processing we are doing an upsampling here uh, where is it we are doing an upsampling uh, so then uh, this becomes a filter bank problem so that is the uh, this is not related to machine learning at this point okay uh, so i think that's all with the questions we have uh, so thank you so much sir for the elaborate explanation of your approach um, I, and it was quite interesting to uh, see this uh, innovation in this ADCs. So now I request uh, Dr. Mahesh uh, to say a few words about the talk and uh, thank the chief guest. Uh, thank you very much, uh, Dr. Bibudatta Sahu, sir, for uh, uh, detailed explanation on uh, ADCs and how the sampling is done and all those things. I have one question that is, uh, if we go for uh, this millimeter wave applications, uh, say 26 gigahertz or 28 gigahertz, uh, what are the challenges right. in uh, designing this is, uh, how do you, uh, you have any comments on that? So uh, uh, what I think is that at, uh, at those range, uh, when you go for 26 gigahertz and 28 gigahertz, uh, I mean 28 gigahertz or 56 gigahertz ADCs, um, yeah, you will uh, uh, most because the bandwidth is not the full Nyquist band. Suppose we, uh, I have the signal at 56 gigahertz, my bandwidth will be probably one gigahertz around 56 gigahertz. Am I right? I mean that is how it is because it's 400 megahertz or something is the carrier bandwidth. So if I look at it that way, so we can break down the problem. What I feel is that I haven't worked on it to be honest. So let me just think uh, say uh, that this is how I would look at it. So it becomes an IF sampling problem. And that means my ADC sample rate need not be that high, but what we need to make sure is that my system that is receiving the signal should have that much of a wide bandwidth. So uh, that means uh, uh, the analog signal should, uh, 56 gigahertz analog sh signal should be able to get into the ADC reliably. And then uh, we could use a low sample rate based on whatever is the bandwidth of the signal. So suppose a bandwidth is one gigahertz, we might use a 10 gigahertz ADC. So uh, for one gigahertz, ideally we need two gigahertz, but we need some filtering operation to make sure that all our um, aliases are gone. So that's why I'm giving, taking 10 times more so that the fifth order anti-alias filter is going to, bandpass filter is going to uh, get rid of uh, all the uh, uh, issue of, uh, um, uh, the, uh, the uh, alias components and uh, that is how I would approach the problem so but I am uh, I have not worked on it so I would not I don't know what should uh, ideally speaking I should not be commenting too much on it that is how I would approach at this point thank you thank you very I much, I... yeah yeah thank you thank you very much sir for sharing your knowledge on uh, analog digital converters uh, sir, if you don't mind, can you switch on your video? We'll just take one picture so that it's for our records. Uh, uh, Kirti oh, uh, Actually, yeah, what yeah. is uh, the problem is that my uh, cam, uh, this, I'm taking it from my office. Uh, the camera of my uh, laptop doesn't work. Oh, so, okay. Oh, okay, okay, okay. No problem, sir. No problem. So, so yeah. is there, uh, uh, I don't know what. Yeah, no problem, sir. No, okay, it's okay. It's yeah. Okay. Uh, Thank you, Dr. Mahesh. Thank you, yeah. uh, Ms. Satish. Uh, and uh, I see Dr. Su Dr. Suganti, yeah. right? Yeah. Suganti, yes. Yeah. Yes. yes, Dr. Yeah. Suganti. Yeah. Thank, Thank you. you very much, sir. Thank you very much for your Thank nice you for talk. Thank you for inviting me for the talk. Yeah. Thank, you. Thank, Thank you so much, sir. Thank you. I will close uh, the matter. So, okay. Yeah, just uh, all the participants. Tomorrow we'll be having the talk a little bit early. Like we'll start at five o'clock, and we have two talks tomorrow. You will be sent the uh, uh, links for both the talks. So kindly join us at five p.m. tomorrow. So yeah, with this we'll conclude this session. See you all tomorrow uh, at five p.m. Thank you. Uh, thank all. you all. Thank you all. Thank you. Yeah. Thank you, sir. Thank you. Thank you all.